Welcome to Reflections, a show that seeks to examine if others see God in your reflection and how Scripture relates to us in this day and age. Peace and all God's blessings be with you. I am Father Bob Janine, the pastor of Mission St. Sergius and Bacchus, an all-inclusive, welcoming, affirming, independent Catholic Church of the Reformed Catholic Church. I am also the Servant General of the Order Franciscans of Mercy. And today we are reflecting on the readings for the fifth Sunday of Lent. And I'm entitling my homily, Always Trust in God. And it pretty much sums it up. Always trust in God. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains but a grain of wheat. But if it does, dies, it produces much fruit. You'll find those words in John 12, verse 24. And they have many meanings to many people. Basically, it was foretelling that in order for life, the life of the church, our everlasting lives, to happen, Jesus Christ had to die. Because in his passion, in his death, he took the sins of the world with him. And in his resurrection and ascension, he conquered death and provided us with the forgiveness of our sins and opened the doors to heaven for us to have everlasting life. So, those words of John in John were truly, they were foretelling the death of Christ. And we here now are in the fourth week of Lent, a time when we're asked to reflect upon our lives, on how well we are doing in living the gospel of Jesus Christ, the teachings of Christ, the truth that God wanted us to know. How well are we doing? The parable, I believe, of the wheat falling into the ground also gives us an insight on how we profess our love for Almighty God. Do we have God in our lives daily? Do we pray daily? Do we start our day talking to God, thanking for God for letting us have another day of life? <laughs> I know many of you viewers out there don't even contemplate that, but when you get to be my age, 83, opening your eyes and being able to get out of bed, that's a good day. It's starting out is a good day. I know that out there in this secular world that we live in, people ridicule those of us that try to put God first, try to live the gospel, try to be compassionate and merciful and forgiving. Yeah, we're ridiculed. 
They've even... <laughs> they've even created a TV comedy. A comedy, mind you. On living the Bible. I believe that's the title of the show. And it's about this man who says and decides that he's going to live the Bible, live it exactly as it says. And he goes and tells the priest in a confessional box, and there's a shot of him, and then there's a shot of the confessional. The, uh, many of you probably never even have seen, well, maybe you've seen them in churches, these little boxes that were along the side with the door, and there were doors on either side, or there were curtains, and you could go in, and in between, there was this enclosed area and a little window, and the slide would open, and you'd say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been so long since my last confession. And on the other side of that window was a priest. And after you told him your sins, he'd give you a penance to do and give you absol absolution. Nowadays, in 90% of the churches, at least in the United States, you sit right opposite the priest. And it's called reconciliation rather than confession. In other words, you're there to reconcile yourself with Almighty God. Well, in this TV comedy, it shows him telling the priest he's going to live the gospel, live by the Bible. And the priest gets a big laugh out of it. And then there's, a, and I've seen the trailers to this show. That's how I know about it. And there's another trailer that shows him because he was told that, well, if you want to live exactly like the Bible, you can't wear different cloth. Everything that you have has to be the same kind of cloth. So then there's a shot of him in this all white cloth, cotton or whatever, and he looks like the good humor man. Uh, and the good humor man, by the way, was an ice cream vendor. For those of you that are too young to remember these things. Anyway, they built a show around this idea that it's funny to even contemplate that you're going to live according to Scripture. And there are other voices out there. Other voices out there who tell you you're going to be condemned to hell if you do this. You're going to hell for that. <laughs> you're going to hell for everything. And you're going to hell for how God created you. I'm talking about people who are of the GLBTQI persuasion. And it's not a persuasion. And it's not a lifestyle. It's how people are created. Some people are created with an attraction to the same gender. And they actually have true and f are capable of having a true love for one another and a commitment, a lifelong commitment to one another. I personally know a couple who have been together for 32 years. That's, that's even before or actually maybe around the time that the gay pride came out at Stonewall. They've been together for 32 years. I know another couple who have adopted children and are raising them and they're in a loving, committed relationship and those children are being raised with a great deal of love. But there are people out there who scream, you're going to hell because you're queer. I have a response for those people. 
how dare you take on jo God's job. Only God can say who's going to hell or who's not going to hell. The only human, only person, the only person who can tell you or say that a person is not going to have everlasting life in heaven is Almighty God. So no human being has the right to tell someone that they're going to hell. We don't even know that Hilter, Hitler or that Judas Iscariot has gone to hell. We don't know that because at the very last instant in their mind, never mind spoken, in their mind all they had to do was say, Lord, help me, forgive me, for I have sinned. And their sins would be forgiven. Everything that God created is good. Everything that God created has a purpose and a reason, and God knows what that reason is. And it's us, up to us to find out the reason. Why did he create plants and things that are poisonous? But maybe there's something in that plant that can help cure something. Or maybe there's something in the jellyfish that can help people, supposedly, according to a commercial, help people's minds improve. Everything we need to exist, God created, and he gave us dominion over it, which meant we were to be the caretakers of it. Well, sadly, we haven't done a very good job of that. And sadly, some of the things he created no longer exist. Condemning a creation of God is in, fact, in effect claiming that we are more powerful than God. And that is why Satan was cast out of heaven. It is a grave and serious sin. Probably the most mortal of sins. Since you're claiming that you know and are better than God. Wake up. We are not perfect. We as humans are imperfect. It is our goal to try to seek to be as perfect as a human being can be. Our Lord Jesus Christ and the Blessed Mother may be the only, well, Jesus Christ certainly is the only perfect human being to ever have walked this earth. Followed closely by our Blessed Mother and then by the saints. Sainthood is having achieved a state of of perfection. Not perfect perfection, but a state of perfection. By our very nature, we're prone to sin, and Satan knows this, and he uses every guile on the face of the earth in his bag of tricks to try to convince us to go to his side. He promises, just as he promised our Lord Jesus Christ, power, fame, fortune, money.
God knew we were imperfect. God knew we were going to sin. And so Almighty God sent His beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to earth. Not as a, human, as a fully grown human being. He, he could have just appeared. No, He came into this earth the same way that each and every human being comes into this earth. Being born of a woman. As a baby and coming through and living all of the stages of life that every human being goes through. Being exposed to all of the weaknesses of human beings. Only to finally reach that point for which God sent him. the point that we celebrate and think of all during this Lenten season. And will soon, one week, be following his every step from the entry into Jerusalem until his death and resurrection from the dead. One whole week. Eight days, from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. Christ endured the most horrendous suffering that any human being ever had to endure. Sure, lots of people were crucified. It was one of the most horrendous and ignominious ways for the Romans to kill people that they considered to be their enemy. But in Jesus' case, before he got nailed to that cross, he was beaten, scourged, whipped, and then had to carry that cross that weighed probably more than he weighed along the Via Della Rosa the road of sorrows, as it's now called, to be nailed to that cross, pierced with a sword or a spear, and ultimately die. But in before doing so, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiving to the very last moment, He is always there to forgive. God loves us. God loved us so much that he was willing to die so that we could have forgiveness of our sins. Love. We, in turn, are to love God. And love requires a commitment. A commitment on our part. And what was that commitment? The commitment is to try to the best of our human ability to live as Jesus taught us. He summed it up on the Sermon on the Mount. It is summed up in the corporal works of mercy. It was summed up when Jesus said the two great commandments, love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and body. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then, love one another as I have loved you. 
Love requires a commitment, a commitment from us to try humanly at our best to live those Beatitudes, to feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, bury the dead. In this final weeks of Lent, let's ask ourselves how well we're doing that and where we need to improve, make a commitment to improve, to do better. That's the challenge, the challenge we have to live and love God with our whole hearts, minds, souls, and bodies. I pray that Almighty God will give us the wisdom and the grace to accomplish the transformation that we need to make so that we are better able to know God, love God, and serve God. Until we meet again, I invite you to please visit our websites, www.orderfranciscansofmercy.org or www.missionstsergius.org. There you will see what's happening with us You'll find links to our TV show. You'll find links to the weekly printed homily. You'll find prayers. And you'll also see a little oval, most of the time, that says donation. If you put your cursor on it, it will take you to PayPal, where you can safely and securely make a donation to help this ministry do the work it's doing. For without the generosity of our donors, we can do nothing. We, of our own accord, do not have the funds necessary to maintain this ministry. We are serving four facilities with masses and visiting others and visiting shut-ins and trying to raise and help get food to the poor and clothing to those who need it. And there's this TV show. So please consider making a donation. I don't like having to do this, but we're struggling. We need your help. Until we meet again, may God bless you and keep you. May he let his light shine upon you and fill you with his infinite mercy and love. May God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This program was made possible by your Franklin friends and neighbors. Good folks, just like you. Thanks for supporting Franklin TV. And thanks for watching.